I'm not hesitant. I'm going to live, got to live the life. You got to enjoy, do the things that we love to do. That's the whole point in getting, if you want to call it a second chance, getting a second chance is to go out and enjoy the things that, that I enjoy doing. Hello, and welcome once again to the TriDoc Podcast. This is the episode for August 23rd, 2024. My name is Jeff Sankoff, the TriDoc, an emergency physician, triathlete, triathlon coach, and multiple Ironman finisher, coming to you as always from beautiful, sunny Denver, Colorado. This past weekend, I got to do something that I really enjoy. It's something that I have done for the last several years, and that is participate in the SBT gravel or steamboat gravel race that takes place every August in Steamboat, Colorado. This is an event that I started partaking in back in 2018 when I did the Black Course, all 140 miles of it. Decided that uh, I was glad that I did the Black Course once, but I figured once was probably adequate. And then since then, have pretty much always done the Blue Course, which comes in at 100 miles. This year, though, I uh, took it down a notch and did the Red Course because I was joined by my son, Adam, who has taken a liking to cycling and uh, had done the Green Course last year for the first time, which was 37 miles and felt that he was ready to step it up. And so we met in the middle and did the 60 mile green course this year, or sorry, 60 mile red course this year. And once again, it was just a spectacular event on a magnificent course on a beautiful day and much fun was had. I have to tell you, if this is something that you have not tried yet, gravel riding, I highly recommend it. It is just a spectacular way to spend a day on your bike, not fearful of automotive, interactions. You are usually in or finding yourself in some beautiful parts of rural countryside where you will get some really magnificent vistas. And a lot of gravel riding is pretty challenging. There's a lot of hills, a lot of steep little grades you have to come up. And uh, it's just a, a really nice way to get out and do a different kind of bike riding than you would normally get to do. Now, I have spoken on this program in the past recently about how I feared that the SPT gravel might have been getting to the point where it was going to be a victim of its own success. And I said that because this year, a lot of the communication coming from the organizers seemed to indicate that the ranchers uh, in and around the route in Route County, which is where Steamboat is located, seemed to be giving a lot of pushback to the organizers and seemed to be making a lot of noise that they weren't going to support the event taking place in the future. It wasn't exactly clear to me where this was coming from, except that, as always, these are rural people who drive pickup trucks and, I guess, seem to think that the roads even though they are public, running through their properties, belong to them, and they didn't seem willing to share them with cyclists even for one day a year. Now, to be fair, the cyclists haven't always held themselves up to the best kind of behaviors. There have been reports of littering, gel wrappers, bottles, for example, and even public urination. Though, as I pointed out to the organizers when I spoke to them this past weekend, these ranchers have animals on their property, and the animals are doing a lot more urination than any bikers are, but that's a whole other kind of conversation. Nonetheless, it's not nice to have to look out your window and see cyclists off their bikes and peeing on your property, so I get that. Still, I was concerned that a small number of ranchers was going to scuttle an event that so many thousands of people were coming from really all around the world to enjoy, and an event that has met with just amazing success because the organizers have done such a fantastic job of developing courses that are so terrific and supporting the racers and supporting women and inclusion of some really amazing groups, uh, all bodies on bikes and uh, race. I'm trying to remember the organization, but a an organization that supports minorities on bikes. Uh, it just really great outreach on the part of the SPT Gravel. And I spoke with the one of the organizers this past weekend, and she assured me that the tenor and tone of the emails coming from the race organizers was 
totally accidental. It, it, it was being interpreted by not just me, because I've spoken with several other people who were doing the event who also felt that the tone of the emails suggested that the SPT Gravel was potentially in trouble. And she was really upset by that because she did not want that to be coming across. The SPT Gravel is secure. It is going to be happening as far as they're concerned, indefinitely into the future. And it was really just a small number of ranchers who were making a lot of noise. And unfortunately, that noise was very visible on race day as we were riding through these beautiful roads and beautiful countryside. Some of the ranchers had signs on their property with big like circles and a cross through it and no gravel race and and that kind of thing, making it seem like we were very unwelcome. But the reality is that the majority of the county and the majority of the ranch families along the route were actually very supportive. And many were actually out there cheering us on. So I have had or I have extended an invitation to the SPT Gravel organizers to come onto this podcast to talk about this and to talk about the kinds of challenges that they have dealt with because I think it mirrors a lot a microcosm of what we as cyclists when we are training are dealing with in terms of our interactions with people on the roads who really don't understand us and don't understand the fact that we own the roads too, and we're just trying to do what we love, and we don't want this conflict. So I look forward to that conversation. You can hear it coming up on an upcoming episode. I'm very hopeful that I will get her to come on for an interview in a very near future, and that episode will be broadcast very shortly. But if you have a chance to consider the SPT Gravel in the future, and unfortunately is a very successful event, they have to use a lottery system to gain entrance, but that lottery will be opening in the next couple of months. Keep an eye open for it. I will mention it when I get the emails about the lottery coming open. I will mention it on this show because if you have tried gravel racing, the SPT Gravel is definitely an event you want to try and get onto your calendar. There's not a lot of triathlons in August and mid-August is a great time to do a long gravel ride that you can find. And again, there are many different events uh, as short as 37 miles, as long as 125 this this year. Uh, next year, it might go back up to 140 for the Black Horse, and then a couple of different distances in between. It makes for a spectacular weekend in a beautiful place, and I highly recommend it. On the show today, we have a couple of good segments in the medical mailbag. I'm going to be talking with Coach Juliet Hockman about muscle typology, specifically answering a question once again from Uber Patreon supporter and Uber question asker Xenia Parker. Xenia wants to know whether or not knowing our muscle typology, specifically how much slow and fast twitch fibers make up our muscles. Does knowing this help us inform how we train and how we race? It's a really interesting question, and we found some really interesting research that looks into this, and we are going to delve into all of it, and that's going to be coming up very shortly. A little bit later on, I'm going to be speaking with a colleague of mine, Dr. Kenan Hurd. Kenan is an emergency physician who works at the University of Colorado Hospital, both as an emergency physician and a toxicologist, but he also is a very avid endurance athlete, having participated in Ironman triathlons several years ago, and now being more of a runner and cyclist, both on the road and on the mountain bike and gravel circuit. Kenan is about my age, late 50s, and recently was running in a, of all things, a one-mile fun run with his kids when he suddenly collapsed in cardiac arrest. He is going to be on the program today, which suggests, thankfully, that the outcome from that cardiac arrest was positive. But I wanted to have him on the program because I think that his experience speaks to a couple of different things. Number one, how you can be fit, how you can be training, how you can have no symptoms whatsoever and still the worst possible thing can happen. How being in the right place when that happens can be so important. Kenan had very rapid bystander CPR, and it's a suggestion once again of how important it is to know this important life-saving skill because you never know when someone's going to go down near you and you can be that person providing bystander CPR. And then how it turns out that his angiogram, his catheterization that he had, didn't really show anything. And that, to me, was probably one of the most scary things of the whole story. Kenan and I are going to talk about his experience and where he's at now, and that's coming up just a bit later on. 
Before all of that, I want to take my customary moment to thank all of you who have decided that for about the price of a cup of coffee per month, you would like to support this podcast in the form of becoming a Patreon supporter. Patreon supporters gain access to bonus episodes that come out about every month or so. And those who uh, decide to subscribe at $10 per month get access to a special thank you gift in the form of a pretty cool BOCO TriDoc podcast running hat. If you would like to learn more about how you can support the podcast, make your way over to the Patreon site at www.patreon.com forward slash TriDoc podcast. You could see the different levels of support that you can get in on and get access to all of the bonus episodes that have come out to this point and those that will be coming out in the future. As always, I thank you very much just for considering. And of course, to all my Patreon supporters, thank you for your continued support. It means the world to me, keeps the podcast going, and couldn't do it without you. It's time again for the Medical Mailbag, that segment of the program, and I'm joined by my friend, my colleague, Juliet Hockman. Juliet, welcome back to the program. It's good to see you and uh, have you back. I wonder how many, I'll have to check and see how many people went and watched us. On the YouTube video we made last night. I know, it was probably cast of millions. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, it's probably got more views than anything else we put. It should, anyways. Uh, We're the most popular people out there. <laughs> yeah. All right. So this question comes from uh, one of our listeners, uh, Zenia Parker. Thanks so much. You're always such an engaged uh, member of our TriDoc community. So thank you very much. She wants to know, if knowing your muscle typology, in other words, if you think about fast twitch muscles and slow twitch muscles, if knowing... How many or how much you have of type one or type two is helpful in determining how we train as triathletes? It's a great question. People are likely familiar, just in case they're not. Let's just take a couple of seconds to talk about it. Our muscles uh, come in two different types of muscle fibers. They're made up of two different types of muscle fibers, type one and type two. Type 1 are considered fast twitch fibers. They're the ones that are useful for sprinting endeavors. They're the ones that go from a dead stop to maximum contraction very quickly. The type 2 fibers are slow twitch fibers. They're the ones that take a little while to warm up, but they can go forever. And depending on your genetics, your muscle mass will have different proportions of type 1 and type 2 fibers. Some people are endowed with 60, 70% of type 1 fibers. And in that case, those people are going to be incredibly proficient at sports that require very fast sprinting type of things. So you can imagine that people who are, we just finished with the Olympics, all of those people who showed up on the track to do hundreds, 200s, 400s is probably pushing it. But uh, certainly anything less than 200 meters sprints, those are going to be real fast twitch predominant. And in your world, Juliet, we were talking before, rowing, right. a different story, right? Because I, yes. I, there's no short course, right? There is no short course. So rowing is always 2,000 meters, which is um, around, depending on the boat class, six minutes. And what you and I were talking about is I always laugh that apparently I'm very good at this six-minute distance, and yet I've also had success in, in triathlons of anywhere from an hour and 10 minutes to five hours, Right. And how does that translate? But what you rightly pointed out is that when we talk about people with the predominance of fast twitch fibers, we're really talking about efforts of a minute or less. So my analogy of six minute rowing race to longer triathlon is irrelevant because those would both be considered more in the endurance category. But to be clear, it's not just the 100 and 200 meter sprinters. It is efforts, short burst efforts throughout the course of something longer. And the example that you were using is perhaps mountain biking, BMX cyclists, track cycling, those could all fall under the category of those athletes who are more successful are the ones who have a larger percentage of fast twitch fibers. Yeah. Even Tour de France riders, like if you look at the sprinters, Jasper Mark Phillipson, Mark Cavendish, those guys who are the real, they can make it through the Tour de France, but they're not going to do well on the climbs. They're not going to do well on the time trials, but they do great when it comes to that last 30 seconds, minute, whatever it is that they need to exert this incredible amount of power and ramp up the speed to these just ridiculous speeds to be able to make the sprint to the finish. Those guys, although they have incredible endurance, their predominant muscle typology is going to be fast twitch fibers because they have the need and the ability to do that. So Xenia's question to me was a little bit longer in her email. And basically what she was asking me was, 
it, it does your typology influence how we should train? Does knowing your typology mean we should train differently and should we do different kinds of activities to, to really address how our muscles are? And it's a really interesting question. Did you, when you were training, did did you encounter this at all? Did, did we all do sure. the high intensity stuff, right? And we all do as triathletes. We're certainly doing over training. We're we're doing intervals and things like that to try and leverage what fast twitch muscle we have and to try and build that in. But when you were doing your training for these six minute races, I'm sure you were also doing shorter stuff. Yes, absolutely. As a rower. I remember clearly doing these incredibly intense minute to a minute and a half efforts where you would finish them and just be done. And then we would also sometimes do shorter efforts even than that. And as we know in triathlon, even if you're going and doing sprint Olympic half Ironman, you're probably still doing a 30 second, one minute, all out best average for the set type of efforts to include in your threshold piece of your training. So those are all still valuable, even if the ultimate event that we're racing is more of an endurance event. And one of the things I wanted to ask about is help me understand this or help all of us who are not scientists and doctors understand this, then it's not like you are all the way over on one end of the continuum and you have a massive amount of slow twitch or on the other end of the continuum, which is a massive amount of fast twitch. Everybody's on somewhere on this continuum. Do we have some athletes that kind of sit halfway in the middle that maybe have an equal number? Or does evolution skew us one way or the other? No, 100%. There's, it's all over the place. Okay. And I'll talk about the research in a second, but I just wanted to go back for half a second and just talk about this idea of training the different muscle fiber types. Because when we do different types of training, that's exactly what we're doing. So when we do this kind of zone two longer efforts where we're just out there and just lower heart rate, but just going for a long time, we're working on the slow twitch muscle fibers. Lance Watson, our coach, but he sure. coaches both of us. He's also the person that that runs life sport coaching where we both work. He's always talking about training different systems. And I always think in my mind, I conceptualize that as being, oh, today I'm working on my cardiovascular slow twitch system. And I have an interval workout tomorrow where I'm going to be, oh, that's going to be working on my high intensity, my, my fast twitch fiber system. And by getting both of those systems trained independently, when you go to a race, you're then able to leverage them at different times, right? So you're using the endurance to get you through most of the race, but then you come to a, a steep hill and you need to get up that hill hard. And so you're going to pull on those fast switch fibers to generate a huge amount of power just for a short burst of time to get you up that little sharp, sharp grade to get to the top and then go back to the slow twitch fibers. So you're constantly using them. And yes, to, to get to your question, there is this spectrum of where people are. And so I just wanted to look at the first paper that Nina pulled up for us, this, this particular episode. My intern, Nina Takashima, was tasked with finding some research, and she did a great job as always. She came up with a paper called Muscle Typology of World-Class Cyclists Across Various Disciplines and Events. Now, this is obviously going to be a very select group of people. These are going to be people who are at the very top of their sports. And this study looked at 80 world-class cyclists and did very special imaging it, it called Proton Magnetic Resonance spectroscopy, which is HMRS, in order to non-invasively assess muscle typology. Now, in the old days, to check how much type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers, you had to do a biopsy. So you had to actually cut into the muscle. You had to take a little piece of the muscle, and then you had to investigate it under a microscope and do some dyeing and do all this stuff. And then you could come out and say, oh, in this muscle, this person has so much type 1 and so much type 2. That obviously, not really practical. Invasive, yes. A, a bit invasive, a bit <laughs> painful. Yeah. Now they can do this uh, very specialized HMRS. However, I will point out HMRS, not available in most places. It's very specialized, so not going to be terribly practical, but at least doesn't require cutting into the muscles. So they looked at 80 different cyclists, and I'm not going to bore you with all the details here, but what they basically found was the cyclists who were ranked in the top 100 for flatter terrain, so think your Tour de France women, your Tour de France men, they showed that they had 
just enormous amounts of type 2 muscle fibers, like ranging uh, up to about 65 to 70 percent of their muscle fibers were type 2 muscle fibers. And type 2 is that uh, slow twitch, just to be clear. The slow that's twitch the slow twitch. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. That's right. So very impressive. When they looked at cyclists who were doing BMX or track, these people had faster muscle typology, which was exactly the opposite. They had about 70% of their muscle fibers were type 1 or fast twitch muscles. And it just goes to show, now, it's not, we don't think, now you're born with this, you can't shift your muscles. So it's not like the BMX and the track cyclists developed this type. They likely gravitated to these sports because they just found that they were better at it. And sure. why were they better at it? Because their muscle type was like right. this, right? And same thing for the in, in the endurance cyclists as well. So the authors of the study just went on and just said at the end, they said, well, knowing muscle typology might be beneficial for individuals to help select what sport they go into, but it also might be beneficial for knowing how to train and how to recover. And I thought that was an interesting conclusion because they didn't look at training and recovery in this particular study, but we did find another one where they, we found several actually where they did. Here's one that says the muscle fiber typology substantially influences time to recover from high intensity exercise. So this was a really interesting study. And I think this is the nuts and bolts of it. And basically what they did is they looked at only male athletes in the study, unfortunately, but it is what it is. No reason to think men and women would be terribly different, but you never know if, uh, if you studied women, would they find the same thing? At any rate, they did, again, this HMRS study where imaging to look at people's muscles. And what they found out was that people who had more fast twitch fibers, that group tends to accumulate more fatigue, has a much more prominent decline in the ability to generate power from one set to the next, and requires much more time to recover than did the group that had a higher number of slow twitch muscles, which I think is really interesting. So yeah. they were able to generate the same amount of power in the first set, mm -hmm. but on repeated sets, especially if the recovery time was short, the fast twitch group just fell right off. They just, they couldn't do it. And the slow twitch group was able to just keep doing it over and over again on shorter rest, which but I thought was really fascinating. perhaps to a different level of success? If you gave the fast twitch people enough time to recover, the fast twitch people could generate more power more in a power. shorter amount of time. Right. But over a longer period of time, more than a minute or so, then the fast twitch people were about identical to the slow twitch people in terms of what they could generate on that first set. So when you think about the concept of burning matches, the athletes who required more recovery, they've gotten at the highest level, those athletes, Tour de France, example, to use that again as an example, they're probably thinking, okay, I can only do this over the course of this five-hour race five times, right? Whereas perhaps, so I got to save my matches. Whereas for this, the other athletes, they've got more opportunities, but perhaps less effective against the field. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it just, it, again, I think it's important to note, it doesn't mean that people with more fast twitch can't perform or do well in endurance events. It just means they need to do things a little bit differently, both in right. terms of their training and also in terms of how they strategize in those races. Cavendish, Phillips, and those guys, right? They're there on those stages, the sprint stages. And none of those, none of them, but many of those sprint stages will be lumpy. They will have some climbs in them and they will fall off, right? And they will then make their way back with the help of their team. They right. will make their They're way back so that yeah. in the last 10 kilometers, they suddenly, after being dropped off and, and not being visible, all of a sudden, in the last 10 kilometers, all those guys are right at the front. And you're like, how did they do that? Where did they come from? Right. And it's because they have strategized to know that they are going to measure their effort. They're just going to go super easy until they need to, and then they're going to go super hard and, and keep it for the end, which I think is really interesting. And that comes up in the last of these studies, which is the relevance of muscle typology in sports. This comes from Belgium in 2021 and talks about how athletes with a slower myotype, so athletes who have a higher predominance of slow twitch muscle, may be better suited for even paced racing strategies that take advantage of their superior running or cycling economy, whereas athletes who have fast myotypes, so higher fast twitch muscles, they're probably better suited to have a slower start and a fast finish 
that utilizes their high sprint capacity. So exactly like I was just saying, right? And we can easily translate this to triathlon. Like, just think if you had a Mark Cavendish type of athlete, that athlete can go into the swim, can just take it easy on the swim, right? Get into, get onto the bike, make sure that they bike easy with a, maybe a lower overall wattage, but they can hit any short climb significantly harder than the average athlete. They can actually use a VI that is, we always talk about a VI of 1.05 or better. Right. I would say that a, a fast twitch predominant athlete probably could go higher than that because they can leverage their sprinting ability and they're really strong, as long as the climb is not super long. Short climbs just burst up those uh, short climbs and then really towards the end of the bike, start really hammering towards the end of the bike. And then when they get on the run, same thing, right? Maybe a slow first half of the run and then a much faster second half of the run. Right. And when you think about this, when you think about this in terms of triathlon adjacent sports that are not individual time trials, which is what most triathlons are, right? We have no group dynamic out there really uh, amongst the age groupers. I was just thinking about this in terms of like when I do gravel racing in the spring or my athletes do gravel racing, a lot of times I will be racing up with the men's field, their local races, everybody starts together. And I know that if I'm with three or four guys and we're in the second half of the race, I know they're going to out-sprint. And that's actually less to do with muscle type as it is just with the fact that they're men and I'm a woman. But, and so I'm already thinking, okay, there's this long sustained climb coming up. I'm more of a slow twitch athlete and I'm a woman. This is where I'm going to drop. This is where I'm going to drop these guys because there's no way I'm going to be able to beat them at the end, right? So it's the same type of idea in terms of applying a strategy, less to do with fi fibers, more to do with, in this case, gender, but it's the same sort of concept in terms of how to st strategically approach a race and in, in terms of what your own skill set is. A hundred percent. And not just your skill set, but your biology, which Sorry, I think you're talking about, right? Yeah, yes, leveraging your, yeah, leveraging your biology and leveraging that in terms of the overall course, the overall where you are in the race and constantly bringing that to bear. I think that makes a lot of sense. We both worked with an athlete at camp uh, back in the spring who was just a phenomenal descender, right? She would be the kind of person that if you know there's a long descent in this race, don't kill yourself going up the hill. You're going to make up a lot of time on that descent. And that's 100%. the same kind of thing, right? Yeah. Use your skill sets, use your biology to, to maximize where you're going to make up the time and just recognize that it's okay to give up some time in different parts of the races because you're confident where you're going to do well. Sure. There's another couple of things I want to bring up from these studies that I think are important. Number one, fast twitch predominant muscle types may have a higher risk of muscle injuries, which I thought was interesting. And frequently, how often are we watching these sprinters, right? They, they're magnificent, yeah. right? They, are, they, they have these amazing chiseled physiques. And then they come out of the blocks and one of them will just pull up lame. And I always used to think I, I make sense, right? It's this explosive movement. And even though they're limbered up and even though they've warmed up and everything else, it's just sudden. It turns out that fast twitch muscle fibers tend to have a lower integrity than do slow twitch muscle fibers. Mm. And so they have a higher vulnerability to rupture and to tearing, which I thought it was really interesting. Yeah. So that kind of might explain why we see sometimes these Everyone sprinters. grabbing their hamstring. Just, yeah, <laughs> right exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but, but the all other of thing, the... Go ahead. The other thing that I just want to highlight is that there was a paper that looked at tapering mm. and suggested that the way people who have fast twitch predominant myotypes train and taper should probably be different. Fast twitch athletes need to train less frequently with longer periods of recovery between sessions and need to taper for longer than athletes that have slow twitch predominant muscle fibers, which again goes back to this idea that fast twitch uh, muscles need longer to recover before they can act at uh, their maximum capacity, which I thought was interesting. Sorry, you were going to say something. Yeah, no, it was reminding at that point exactly the taper t before a race. For sure, but also, as you say, longer rest between max sessions within a workout. I remember working with that. I had heard an athlete once who had been an Olympic trial swimmer, and he, I think he was 100 meter flyer, 100 meter breast. Anyway, and I remember having him do 400s for the first time, and it absolutely rocked his world because he had just always done 25s and 50s and 100s and the super fast stuff. And also, just the amount of rest that those guys take 
on those super intense sprint sessions is double, triple, whatever in a work to a rest to work ratio, because they do require more rest to avoid injury and to be able to perform repeatedly at the same incredibly high level. So yeah, it's making me think of that. So you're talking about rest within a session as well as tapering for a big race and thinking about that. Rest within a session, mm -hmm. rest between sessions right. as well. Yes. Like they were even saying, suggesting that fast twitch predominant muscle types don't even need to train as frequently. Like they should train less frequently to maximize recovery between sessions, which, right. and I not being a sprinter, not ever having trained as a sprinter. I don't know if that's how they train. Like they, I, d I don't know. So I, I can't speak to that. Be interesting. If anybody out there has ever raced as a sprinter, I would love to hear if your training regimen was such that you trained less frequently because right now I'm training seven days a week. I know you are as well. Yeah. And I don't, I'm certainly no worse for wear for the most part. And I wonder if sprinters train less frequently or if they train every day, but they really only do sprint focus training like three days a week. And then the right. other four days are not that kind of thing. So that would be interesting. And then yes, the taper is, should be significantly longer. Now, after all this discussion, I think the most, yeah, the most important point, because whenever we have these conversations answering these medical questions, we really want an actionable kind of point. And the problem is there's nothing actionable here because it is not easy to determine what your muscle type. You can probably find a lab somewhere that can do a muscle biopsy, but do you really want to? Right. And is it really going to make that much of a difference for you? Chances are, if you're listening to this podcast, you've been doing triathlon for a while, you've had some measure of success, you probably know you're a slow twitch predominant person or at least 50-50, right? The other thing is that if you are somebody who has had a lot of success in your youth as a BMX race racer, and now you just decided, you know what, I, I want to do triathlon now. You're probably figuring it out. Yeah. So I don't know that you necessarily, you probably know, okay, I probably predominantly fast twitch, but you know what? You've got enough slow twitch to get by. You're yeah. making do. You're going to I don't be know fine. that you need to go. Yeah. yeah. You probably don't need to go get your muscle typed and then drastically change things. Now, with that said, knowing what I know now, I think if I had an athlete who came to me from a BMX background or a track background and told me that they had great success as a sprinter, I might think a little bit about this. I don't know about you. In would, would you change in, things? Particularly in terms of what you've said about increased recovery within a workout, increased recovery between workouts and a different sort of taper. Yeah, that makes total sense. That's great learning, I think, for us as athletes and coaches. I'm sure you've had athletes, as I have, who come from either a track background track as in running track or even football players to some extent who are used to those shorter bursts and you give them a shorter type of workout like a track workout or or shorter intervals and they love them right they just oh my favorite type of work and i love this so much right and whereas you send them out for a little bit more of a grindy three hour maybe it's got some tempo in there they hang their head and <laughs> realize that they have to do it. And that's what you, we were saying at the very beginning is we may not know this scientifically about our own bodies in terms of our exact percentage of slow twitch versus fast twitch, but we tend, even as young people, to gravitate towards what we're good at because that's the most fun. We, it's fun to be good at things. And so often kids will gravitate towards that football or that track versus cross-country running in the fall or, I don't know, longer swim events, that type of thing. Yeah, but I think that we shouldn't put ourselves, we shouldn't like, define ourselves in a way that we box ourselves in because no matter what, unless we're obviously performing at some kind of elite level, uh, if you're an elite rower, you don't necessarily want to say, you know what, I'm just going to try sprinting. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, if you're, if you've had a successful career as an age grouper at, at BMX or track and you decide, you know what, I want to try endurance now, you shouldn't box yourself in and say you can't no. do it. I think you should just be realistic about the fact that you may not have the same degree of success as you did in the sprint type sport just because it, it you may not be as well suited to it, but it doesn't mean you can't do it. It may mean, as I think for myself, if I if some if that person comes to me for coaching, I think now I'm gonna rethink a little bit and change the way I do things and probably give them those longer workouts and throw in these kind of sprint things because it'll engage them and it'll and right. they'll yeah and they'll feel real good about it. So yeah, no, I, I think good. this is fascinating and I'm so happy that we got this question because it really opened up 
a can of worms that I had no idea. And I think it's really interesting. If you have a question that you'd like for us to answer on the podcast, I hope that you will send it in. You can uh, send me an email at tri underscore doc at iCloud.com. You can drop it into the private Facebook group. What? You're not a member? How can that be? If I'm you're, even a member. If yes, if you're not, if you're not, then please uh, look for TriDoc Podcast on Facebook. Answers the three very easy questions. I will grant you admittance. You can join the conversation, leave feedback on everything that you've heard on the show, and of course, ask your questions there. We'll be happy to consider them on a future episode. For now, Juliet, thank you again. This was a wonderful conversation. As always, I very much enjoyed it. We are, what, just about a month away from Tri-Cities? I know. Tri-Cities, which is in Eastern Oregon. I'll see you there at the end of September. But I think you and I will have at least one more recording before then. Yes, we will. Absolutely. All right. Thanks again for a great convo, and uh, I'll talk to you again soon. Okay. Bye, Jim. My guest today is Dr. Kenan Hurd. Kenan is a longtime colleague of mine in emergency medicine at the University of Colorado. He's also a board-certified toxicologist, which means he's a specialist in poisonings and how to manage them. And also, it means he's wicked smart. Kenan is also an endurance athlete, having participated in swimming, running, and triathlon events. And he did Ironman Austria in 1999, though he is a reformed triathlete and is mostly a biker and runner now. On May the 19th of this year, the very day that I was running in the Colfax Half Marathon, Kenan was running a one-mile fun run as part of his kids' running series when he collapsed in cardiac arrest. Fortunately, CPR was administered by bystanders almost immediately, and an automated external defibrillator, or AED, converted his heart back into a stable rhythm before he was rushed to hospital and had a percutaneous coronary angioplasty done, where nothing significant was found. I'm happy to say that Kenan recovered completely, and within a couple of weeks, he was back on his bike performing in a gravel bike race. But he's here today to talk to us about running in your late 50s, having a scary event like he had, and what it means to come back to exercise. Kenan, thank you so much for joining me here on the TriDoc Podcast. It's great to see you healthy and looking well. Thanks, Jeff. It's great to be here. I've always enjoyed following your, uh, your work, and I'm happy to be a part of this. I want to begin first just with a sense of the lead up to this day, the, this, this obviously almost terrible day, but fortunately things worked out. Did you have any inkling that uh, you might have something going on? I, I frequently have talked about sudden cardiac events uh, with triathletes, and I, I have talked about how too often athletes are training and ignoring signs like uh, increased fatigue that they might not kind of realize is related to their heart or some subtle chest discomfort. Did you have any of those things? No, not really. I'd actually been, I'd done a little bit of a swim in college, started swimming again, and I'd actually been doing some fairly high effort reps when I was swimming and I was starting to feel good. The usual sort of mid fifties chronic injuries kept me from running as fast as I would like. It was spraying in Denver. So back on the bike, things were feeling good. We'd actually just done a great ride from Grand Lake up to the top of Rocky Mountain National Park. Fairly good elevation, felt fine the whole way. And, and these are the kinds of things that I often tell people, you're doing a stress test almost all the time. And if you're not having any symptoms or signs, you would think that there's probably no underlying cardiac disease. And in fact, when you had the, angi uh, the angiography afterwards, you were telling me before we started recording, the cardiologist says, you don't really have much going on there. So what was the cause of your cardiac arrest? Yeah, that's the $50 million question is what was the cause? They've done, they did a cardiac MRI, which looks for scar tissue or abnormalities in the way the heart beats and didn't find anything with that. I got a echocardiogram that showed how well the heart functions and that was fine. The angiogram showed some narrowing, what you'd expect wear and tear on a 50, late 50s year old heart, but nothing that looked like it was a, it would cause the acute event. So we're left with don't know bad luck. Hopefully it won't happen again. I have a little I got an AICD, so I got an internal defibrillator. So if it does, I'll be treated for it. But in terms of the good news is there's nothing that's going to get worse. The bad news is we don't have a clear cause. So going back to the day of, what do you remember? Was there anything amiss? Was there anything that kind of let you look back on and think, oh, I probably should have paid attention? I don't think so. I can't say I felt great that day. It was one of those days where it was a Sunday. The race is a Sunday afternoon. And so we did all the other stuff. And we went, as I, as you mentioned, it was my kids, they do a series and the last race of the series, they have the adults can do a, a one mile fun run. And 
I hadn't had a chance to do anything else that day. So I thought, okay, I'll just go and run. And I didn't run particularly hard or anything. And actually my, my watch was captured my heart rate. My heart rate was in the seventies when it actually happened. I was recovering. So I felt, I I can't say I felt like it was the best run ever, but it certainly didn't feel that unusual. And what do you attribute when people have cardiac arrest, you and I both know seeing people who come in in cardiac arrest, what, what do you attribute your fantastic outcome to? I think the biggest thing was, is we were fortunate and one of our, the guys that you and I both trained in our emergency medicine training program was there running with his kids. And he took a look at me and said, that's not right. Came over and checked my pulse and started CPR right away. And then we were fortunate enough to be in Denver and the fire, Denver fire station was about three minutes away. So the fire truck arrived with the AED within five minutes, appropriate CPR, recognizing the situation, starting CPR and getting early defibrillation. I never, I woke up on the way to the hospital. So it was that good. Yeah. And I think it's a critical message and one that we can't emphasize enough as emergency physicians is the importance of knowing CPR. And clearly having an emergency physician right there who recognizes the situation and is level-headed and is able to do things added to it. But Anybody can do CPR. You just need to know the basics, and we should take a moment to emphasize how important that is. And really, if you don't know how to do CPR, it's a really easy skill to learn. And I would emphasize, again, how important, especially if you're participating in endurance events where it's not uncommon to see people collapse at finish lines of running events, especially with a cardiac arrest, and knowing CPR can really go a long way to saving a life. And having an outcome like Kenan has had. So I would encourage everybody to look into that if you don't already know how to do that. So looking ahead then, you came out of this event, you had your angiography, you were in the ICU. I was chatting with you when you were there and you were already doing extremely well and (laughs) remarking to me that you hoped you would be able to go back and do your gravel race. So how fast were you back to doing what you wanted to do? It it would actually went really well. We were back walking and just getting out and and exercising within really within a week or two. And then I was able to get the AICD put in and we actually did the, I think the gravel bike race. So like you said, it was the end of May. The gravel bike race was July 4th weekend. I did end up doing the uh, the 50K instead of the 100K, but it was at, was at elevation. It was still pretty good. It was still a pretty challenging ride. And psychologically, is there any kind of residual here? Knowing you have a clean angiogram is certainly reassuring, but at the same time, it's this whole, what the heck? Were you worried at all doing that gravel ride? I'm sure your wife was worried. My wife has been wonderful. She was there through all of it and had to witness it all. And I know it was much harder on her than it was on me. I basically remember running up the race and then waking up in the ICU. I think because... Fortunately, with the blessing of the medical background is that there's literally nothing else I can do. I have the device in now. That's the definitive treatment. It should work for, if it happens again, it should definitely work. And so I am not, I'm not hesitant. I'm going to live, got to live the life. You got to enjoy, do the things that we love to do. That's the whole point in getting, if you want to call it a second chance, getting a second chance is to go out and enjoy the things that, that I enjoy doing. And what would be your message for other endurance athletes who are our age? You and I are both 57. Uh, w- what would be the message then to other athletes who might worry listening to this and thinking, oh my gosh, how long do I have before something like this happens to me? I think your message that you started off with is right on, which is listen to your body. Again, this is the kind of thing that that could happen without any warning. If we're out riding our bikes, we're out running, you can have an accident. You can have all kinds of other things that are unpredictable happen that you can't spend your life worrying about those. But if you find something that's not right, if you feel like things are not right, get it checked out, take it, address it, and then move on and get back into the things that you love to do. All right. I want to change gears on you completely, radically, and take advantage of your knowledge as a toxicologist. Recently, we've been hearing a lot coming out of the Tour de France about this whole carbon monoxide silliness. Are you familiar with this? I know that Tade was saying that he used it. I didn't, I couldn't, I never quite got the gist of what he was trying to accomplish. At one point, it looked like they were measuring his oxygen carrying capacity, but I wasn't sure if maybe he was deliberately poisoning himself to see if he could increase his his EPO or something. So this is apparently what they're doing. They're using carbon monoxide measurement somehow to determine hemoglobin. I, I, it's not clear to me why or how this works, as opposed to just, say, doing a pinprick and doing an iStat. 
are you familiar with this? Do you know how this works or what the theory is? Because I have not heard anything about this. And I, I tried reading up on it a little bit, and I haven't been able to find a whole lot that explains the devils in the details. No, you, got, you have more insight into it than I do. Obviously, his performance in that race was unbelievable, something we'll probably never see again in our lifetime. So if we may be hearing a lot more about it if that's his, if that's his secret re- recipe. So what could carbon monoxide just give for people have probably heard about carbon monoxide, they understand in general how it's not good for you. Tell, tell us just Cliff Notes version, what does carbon monoxide do? How is it bad? And if you could envision, you alluded to this idea that it could be nefarious. And, and that's been something in the press. People are saying, oh, what are they doing with this carbon monoxide? So what, how is carbon monoxide bad and how could it potentially be used to increase EPO? Okay, obviously not something I would recommend, but I, I could imagine that the carbon monoxide is unique in that it, it basically binds to hemoglobin in a way that prevents oxygen from binding to hemoglobin. So effectively, you're lowering the amount of hemoglobin you have in your body. So if you lower the amount of hemoglobin, that could theoretically stimulate the amount of epogen that your body's producing. And then that when the carbon monoxide goes away, which your body will eventually clear it, you'd have more uh, epogen and then presumably more hemoglobin available. That's total speculation. I don't have any science to back that up, but it's an interesting, an interesting idea, sort of way to stimulate, uh, potential way to stimulate epogen. And you'd have to be super careful, right? You, you, you'd have to the, it's not like you can dose carbon monoxide that easily that you could be sure that you weren't getting into the poison range. So are there setups that you're aware of that people can meter the amount of carbon monoxide they're getting to actually monitor that? There, there, is, there are some medical uses for carbon monoxide. It's a way that you can use, there's a way that you can determine the amount, how well gas diffuses across the lungs, so how well your lungs can absorb oxygen. But that's pretty closely regulated, and we're talking really low, you know, concentrations of carbon monoxide. So I'd be really any type of thing where you were deliberately exposing yourself to carbon monoxide in a non-medical setting seems like a really bad idea. Yeah, yeah. And Taddy made the the comment about it's not like we're standing behind cars and just inhaling out of the tailpipe or anything. So he did make reference to the fact that this was highly technical, but no, none of the riders have really gone into how they're using it or why. And it did sound a little sus. So I guess time will tell. And it doesn't sound like something that could be easily monitored, of course, because biologic passports and testing for exogenous EPO is not going to show much because this is all going to be their own, their own stuff. So it's, yeah, I guess to be continued, we'll have to see. They need a toxicologist on doping uh, panels. Yeah, I, I there's always a, a way if somebody's willing to push the limits, there's always something that they can come up with. Yeah, it's really unfortunate. Looking ahead for you personally, what is going to be on the rest of your calendar for this year? And then how do you envision proceeding? It sounds like you're just full steam ahead and this was just a little blip on your athletic calendar. Yeah, I hope so. The plan is, I don't, I don't have any big plans for the rest of the year. Just I'm going to go out and do some mountain biking this afternoon. Looking forward to that and the usual sort of stuff. I think long term, I'm still looking. I think it's, uh, I think after about 30 years, your Ironman ticket probably expires. So I'll probably need to do, I think when I'm turning 60, I'm looking forward to to maybe trying another Ironman. Oh, we will welcome you back to the fold. Of course, uh, that means we'll be in the same age group. So I don't know. I'll have to make sure we're not at the same event. (laughs) I don't think I'll be competing with you, Jeff. That's for sure. (laughs) Ken, and I'm just happy that you'll be competing at all. So I'm really excited that uh, this went as well as it did. And then it turned out to have no uh, longstanding. Uh, We should say that your experience is very different in that most cardiac dysrhythmias in our age group is related to cardiac disease. And the fact that your angiogram was clear and no obvious cause was found for your dysrhythmia is unusual. Most people are going to have some kind of coronary artery disease. I think it's important that we mention for those who are listening, it's something I've said before, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier in our discussion, maybe we should just talk, just finish up the conversation by reminding people, especially as they get into their late 40s, early 50s, and it does occasionally happen in younger age groups. What are the kinds of things that athletes should be looking for as a sign that maybe they have some underlying cardiac disease that they should 
pay attention to and, and seek help from a doctor. I think a mutual friend of ours, one of our colleagues who worked, works with me at the Poison Center, he was telling me how his big symptom was he just basically couldn't run as much. Like over the course of several months, he found that his pace kept falling and he couldn't figure out why. And he ended up talking to his doctor and doing a stress test and it came up grossly positive, got an angiogram, got his, the arteries cleaned out and went back to running and everything was pretty much back to where it was. So really anything that says your performance isn't right, at least worth talking to your doctor and maybe getting somebody to look at it because coronary disease, as we know, is the number one thing that affects people, kills people in our age. And, and it's something that you can detect. And most importantly, you can get it treated and get back to where you want to be. Yeah. And we, we all know that being fit and staying active is unfortunately not a panacea. You can have underlying cardiac disease simply because of your genetics, simply because of maybe you had an unhealthy lifestyle leading up to the time that you decided to get fit. And all of those things can lay the groundwork for cardiac issues later in life, despite the fact that you're becoming healthier. So you do have to really pay attention. Your heart is a muscle, just like the rest of your muscles. And if that muscle starts to show any signs of weakness, you need to get it checked out. You're wearing a Garmin, most of you, you, or some other device that's measuring your heart rate. Pay attention to that. If your heart rate is higher than you think it should be, that might be a sign that your heart is working hard because it's not working as efficiently. Certainly, any signs of chest discomfort need to be paid attention to, especially as you're exercising. Any signs of uh, palpitations that don't go away very quickly, those need to be paid attention to. If you're wearing your heart rate monitor 24-7, Pay attention to those warnings that tell you irregular heart rhythm. Those are things you need to pay attention to. And then shortness of breath is another one. If you are exceedingly short of breath, that can be a sign of a heart problem. And then for women, don't tend to have the same symptoms that men do. For women, it can often just be excessive fatigue. And this can be fatigue that comes on during exercise and manifests as just an inability to do the kinds of high-intensity intervals because you just feel overly tired. And then it can also manifest as just fatigue at, when you're not training. So pay attention to these things. They're super important. And like Kenan said, they can lead to a, a doctor's visit that can uncover something that you might otherwise not know is there and get it treated early so that you can return to what you want to be doing. Because as Kenan is a great example, it doesn't mean you have to stop. It just might mean you need to have a little device implanted or maybe a couple of stents or something. But it doesn't mean you need to stop doing what you love. It's not a, a major catastrophe if you catch it before something bad happens. Kenan, thank you so much for making the time to come and talk to us about your incident. It's really terrific that you had absolutely no untoward effects. I, I'm, I was so happy to be able to chat with you just a couple of days after it happened and thrilled to find that you were already champing at the bit to get back on your bike. It was a, a very good sign. And I'm glad that it's gone as well as it has. Any parting thoughts or parting words for the listeners out there who might continue to have some concerns? I think you, you we've touched on it all, which is you got to pay attention to your body, but in the end, you got to keep doing the things that you love to do. It's what we love and it makes life worth going on. Kenan Hurd, he is an emergency physician, a toxicologist, a multi-sport athlete in the past and hopefully again in the future, but now he's a runner and biker and a survivor of a recent cardiac arrest and here to tell us all about it on the TriDoc podcast today. Thank you so much for joining me, Kenan. I look forward to seeing you again soon, hopefully somewhere out there on our bikes. All right. Take care, Jeff. We'll see you later. Hi, my name is Rebecca Adamson and I am a proud Patreon supporter of the TriDoc podcast. The TriDoc podcast is produced and edited by Jeff Sankoff, along with his amazing interns, Cosette Rhodes and Nina Takashima. You can find the show notes for everything discussed on the show today, as well as archives of previous episodes at www.tridocpodcast.com. Do you have a question about any of the issues discussed on this episode? Or do you have a question for consideration to be answered on a future episode? Send Jeff an email at try underscore doc at icloud.com. If you are interested in coaching services, please visit try.coaching.com or lifesportcoaching.com where you will find a lot of information about Jeff and the services that he provides. You can also follow Jeff on the TriDoc Podcast Facebook page 
TriDoc Coaching on Instagram and the TriDoc Coaching YouTube channel. And don't forget to join the TriDoc Podcast private Facebook group. Search for it and request to join today. If you enjoy this podcast, I hope that you will consider leaving a rating and a review, as well as subscribe to the show wherever you download it. And of course, there's always the option of becoming a supporter of the podcast at patreon.com slash Podcast. The music heard at the beginning and the end of the show is Radio by Empty Hours and is used with permission. This song and many others like it can be found at www.reverbnation.com where I hope that you will visit and give small independent bands a chance. The TriDoc Podcast will be back again soon with another medical question and answer and another interview with someone in the world of multi-sport. Until then, train hard, train healthy.